Central Michigan University, USA. So, to begin our lecture or to begin with our program, we must give them a very warm welcome. But to give them such a great welcome, may I request our director, Tarifa Neuroscience. Even, he was also named Michigan Professor of the Year in 1997. He currently serves as a scientific advisor for the Michigan chapter of the Huntington's Disease Society of America as senior editor of the Journal of Undergraduate Neuroscience Education and as president of the American Society for Neutral Therapy and Repair. Aside from that, he has also served great publications in international journals also. Let's give a huge round of applause for him. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to uh, be here. This is my uh, first trip to India, and I really, uh, really love the people. I love the uh, uh, temples. The, the, the uh, it's it's a such a, a beautiful uh, country, and uh, I, I'm honored to be here with you today. So, uh, one of the reasons I'm I'm so excited to be here is uh, in the last five to ten years, I've been fortunate enough to have some very, very outstanding students and faculty members from India who have come and worked in our, our lab. And I find uh, the Indian students and, and postdocs and so on to be uh, some of the very best students I've ever had. So I'm always uh, looking for good students that, that uh, would like to work in our labs, and so um, I guess okay. So um, I'm going to briefly talk about a few things. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, idea about our program at Central Michigan University, in case some of you might uh, uh, like to come and visit, or stay, or or apply to our programs. We have undergraduate, graduate, and MS, uh, Master's and uh, Doctor of Philosophy. Um, and then I'm going to give you an idea of some of the research we do. So you can go in and take this faulty gene in Huntington's disease. You can go in and use these tools, and the one we use is CRISPR-Cas9, which is a very easy tool to come in, and you can actually cause a double strand break in that uh, mutated area of, of the gene. What does that do? Well, what it does is you're, you, you basically stop, uh, stop the, the transcription of that, that gene. In other words, it won't produce the, the mutated Huntington protein that causes all these problems. Here's an example of what we're talking about. When you have a gene <coughs> It, uh, it will be transcribed and you'll have a messenger RNA that will then uh, produce the protein. But if you block that, if you block that uh, transcription, you're not going to have that mutated protein. Uh, the problem is, can we do this on just the faulty gene? Will we also break up and, and stop the, the, the production of the good gene. We all need Huntington very early in life. Without it, we would not survive. However, we're finding that if you're an adult, uh, you, don't, you don't need it as much. We don't know if you're gonna have major side effects. So far, it doesn't look like, like you will. It looks like we can just go in and indiscriminately use this, uh, this, this gene editing tool and block the production of that mutated protein. And if that's the case, it'll help a lot of people very soon. So I think within 10 years, we're gonna have an effective treatment for this very, very devastating disease. And I got a, a National Institute of Health grant to test the efficacy of, of GM1 ganglicides. Uh, 
back in 1991. Unfortunately, uh, the source of the game insights from the, that I was getting these came from Albano Term Italy, Fidia Pharmaceutical Company. The problem is that this is very, very expensive to make. They were giving it to me free because I was testing one of the first people to ever test it. We tested it on a Parkinson's disease, it worked very well. We, then we tried it on a Huntington's disease that I showed you, it, started, it worked very well there. Um, but when I got the grant to try it on transgenic mouse models, unfortunately, uh, bovine encephalopathy, uh, uh, mad cow's disease, uh, banned the export of that GM1 ganglia site to my lab. And when I looked at how much it would cost to buy it, it was like $1,500 per milligram. So I was using thousands and thousands of dollars worth of ganglicides every day, injecting them into rats, and, and not realizing how much it, it costs to do this. Um, but fortunately, I met up with Larry Holler this past, uh, maybe three years ago, and he has developed a gangliosidosis lamb model. In other words, ganglioside storage disease. These lambs have 40 times as much ganglioside in their brain. They will die of this disease. And, and when they do, you can take that brain and it has 40 times as much ganglioside than the beef brains that, we were, that were used to produce ganglioside in Italy. And, and so this is 40 times cheaper than uh, what we were using before. And so we have gotten funded from a bunch of sheep herders around the United States to, to test this. Uh, and obviously, if this works, it, it'll be uh, a wonderful uh, new finding. And we started to work on this at Central Michigan University uh, last year, and we're still working on it. The fourth of the five approaches is replacing trophic factors. As I mentioned, uh, GM1 ganglioside uh, and substituted pyrimidines all have been shown to elevate neurotrophic factors. These are lost in Alzheimer's disease, trophic factors are lost in Huntington's disease, they're lost in just about any type of brain disease or brain injury. And if you can restore them and find ways to effectively restore them, you may save the cells and you may overcome some of the deficits. So, as I showed you before, we can see that this, this can happen uh, with GM1 ganglicides, and we think they work synergistically. They work in partnership with the ganglioside, with the trophic factors. In 2003, uh, Laurent Lestadron and I worked on uh, our first stem cell project. We took bone marrow stem cells from rats and injected them into the brain with the idea that maybe they will convert into neurons take the repla uh, replace the lost neurons in our animal model of, of Huntington's disease. And then we tested them on, again, uh, cognitive and motor tests. And as you can see, they modestly helped these animals. But we did not see any replacement of cells. Uh, and so we thought it must be something else than replacing cells that, that, that drove the behavioral recovery. And sure enough, later on we, we, we uh, looked at different types of trophic factors and anti-inflammatory cytokines. So two things are happening here. One, they're reducing inflammation. Two, they're increasing trophic factors. The combination of that's pretty powerful. And uh, we found that over time, we can reduce lesions, we say, and we were using this, for instance, in stroke. 
we can take your skin cells, we can reprogram them, and then we can transplant them into your brain and the area where the stroke was, and hopefully they will uh, take hold and actually could cause cancer. So far, we've been very lucky. We don't see uh, uh, a lot of tumors in, in these transplants, but others have, so there's, there's some concern about this. Nonetheless, when we look at what we found when we transplanted these induced purple stem cells at three different time points, we saw an actual recovery of function. If we look at here at one week, when we gave the transplant to these animals, this is again on that rotating rod. How long can they stay on that rod? They stay on uh, a lot better. They, they had some loss. And the black ones, black bars here, are animals that are untreated. And they get worse and worse and worse. This was treated at one week, and you can see they didn't get so bad. And, and uh, they were almost at normal levels. When we put the transplants at three weeks, these animals were slightly impaired by then, but again, it kept them from getting really, really bad. But by week six, we could see these animals were, is, they, they couldn't stay on that rotating rod at all. They were falling off very quickly. But they, we showed true recovery. This is true recovery of function. We have a true deficit, and a true recovery. And when we looked at the cells, a lot of those had converted into the type of neurons. These are um, uh, medium spine GABAergic neurons. These are neurons that are predominantly lost in Huntington's disease. So we feel that this has a lot of promise for those people that are in the late stages of Huntington's disease. Nothing else can be done to help them. Maybe we can replace the cells. Long way to go to make sure they integrate properly in, in uh, the host tissue. Uh, it may be just they're producing better trophic factors, but this is probably one of the, the greatest recoveries that we've seen uh, with our transplant studies. I did, you can see all this. And currently, I came to this position, and that's because of Gary. He helped a lot of things in my career. I'll tell you all these later. And two steps makes me different. And uh, these are the past stages. I know uh, to getting a job nowadays is difficult. What I think some people say, why you are doing some general course, BSc, MSc, what we do? Some people insisted me to go for pathology, to go for operating the lab, clinical lab. That's why I went to tropical medicine. Uh, diploma in medical laboratory technique and that year from the university, the Central University only two students got first class out of them one I was there and another one so when I was studying here one of the professor in hematology he was a professor in Vietnam College he said why you came to this life as I see you you should go to better way to go to master degree or PhD or research. And he insisted me he should not stay in this field. Like I know.